The following podcast is part of a certified educational activity titled Swimming in Cloudy Water, using the latest guidelines to clear up clinical confusion about T2DM management. Access the entire activity and complete the post-test at peerview.com forward slash ASM860. Downloadable slides and practice aids are also available. Hello, I'm Dr. James Gavin from Healing Our Village and the Emory University School of Medicine in Atlanta, Georgia. Welcome to this timely panel discussion on recent findings from cardiovascular outcomes trials, how they have shaped clinical guidelines in type 2 diabetes, and how we can make these important new developments work for our patients. With me today are two notable individuals whose many contributions to the care of patients with diabetes are well known and highly regarded. Dr. John Anderson is from the Frist Clinic in Nashville, Tennessee. Lucia Novak is a nurse practitioner and director of the Riverside Diabetes Center in Maryland. So now let's begin with a look at what we've learned from recent cardiovascular outcomes trials. You know, these trials were considered burdensome or even unnecessary when the FDA first imposed them as a safety requirement for all new diabetes drugs beginning in 2008. But since then, we've learned that two drug classes, the GLP-1 receptor agonists and the SGLT2 inhibitors, have not only demonstrated cardiovascular safety, some agents in these classes have demonstrated cardiovascular benefit. John, can you summarize the key findings from these studies? Be happy to, thanks Jim. So let me begin by summarizing the trials that have been so influential in shaping our current guidelines. The GLP-1 receptor agonists are agents that provide pharmacological levels of the intestinal hormone GLP-1 to patients with type 2 diabetes to correct a deficiency of or a resistance to the action of this hormone in type 2 diabetes. Next, we had the SGLT2 inhibitors. These agents work primarily by increasing urinary glucose excretion. All of them are administered as once daily tablets. These trials have four very important characteristics in common. First, they were powered for cardiovascular endpoints. They purposely included patients at high risk of CV events, including patients with a history of MI or stroke, heart failure, and CKD. These are the complicated patients that have traditionally been excluded from previous clinical trials of type 2 diabetes medications. Second, they are big trials. The smallest of these studies had over 3,000 participants and the biggest had more than 15,000 participants. Third, they are long trials. The shortest of the studies ran for about two years, much longer than the 26 weeks that's typical for testing glycemic control. Fourth, None of these trials found increased risks of major adverse cardiovascular events, or MACE, with any of these agents. Since CVD is the leading cause of death in patients with type 2 diabetes, we certainly don't want to make a bad situation worse. The great news for our patients is that some of the GLP-1 receptor agonists statistically reduced the risk of MACE relative to placebo by up to 26%. Dulaglutide and liraglutide were shown to be superior to placebo as part of a pre-specified analysis plan in trials large enough and long enough to demonstrate superiority. Rewind is noteworthy for demonstrating superiority in a population where fewer than one-third of patients had a history of CVD. What about the other trials? Elixa was conducted in extremely high-risk patients, all of whom had recent acute coronary syndrome. So it is reassuring that lixazinatide did not increase MACE events in this very vulnerable population. About half of the patients in Excel had no history of CAD, but exenatide ER came very close to demonstrating superiority. The two semaglutide trials were smaller and shorter than the others and were designed to show non-inferiority, which they did. In sustained six, semaglutide also happened to demonstrate superiority, but Pioneer 6, with the smallest number of MACE events overall, lacked the power to do so. That is why not all of these agents currently carry a U.S. FDA indication for reducing CV risk. GLP-1 receptor agonists may also have beneficial effects on renal outcomes. 
Renal dialysis is hard on patients, extremely burdensome on the nation's health care system, and diabetic kidney disease is the number one reason that patients need dialysis. Sedulaglutide, liraglutide, and semaglutide have demonstrated benefit for reducing the progression of diabetic nephropathy, but in trials that were powered for CV, not renal endpoints. So currently, none of these agents has a US FDA indication relating to diabetic kidney disease. Likewise, none of the SGLT2 inhibitor trials reporting so far found increased risks of major adverse cardiovascular events, or MACE. The SGLT2 inhibitors, canagliflozin and empagliflozin, reduced the risk of MACE by up to 20% in patients with type 2 diabetes and established ASCVD. Declared Timmy 58 actually had two co-primary endpoints. And while the MACE endpoint was a near miss, the CV death and heart failure endpoint was significant and noteworthy because less than half the patients in this trial had established AFCVD. But bear in mind that not all of these agents currently carry a US FDA indication for reducing CV risk. And it's not too much of a stretch to say that the heart failure outcomes for SGLT2 inhibitors have created a sensation in the cardiology community. To date, reduction of hospitalization for CHF is a consistent result across the class. All of the SGLT2 inhibitors reporting to date have reduced hospitalization for heart failure by up to 39%. This is clinically meaningful on several levels. Staying out of the hospital is a high priority for patients. But more than that, in patients with heart failure, every new hospitalization increases their risk of death for a year or more after they've been hospitalized. Another consistent benefit of SGLT2 inhibitors is their effect on renal function, with up to 47% reduction on composite endpoints for nephropathy. They also reduce the risk of acute kidney injury by about 41%. These are the first agents since ACE inhibitors that have been shown to improve renal outcomes or heart failure outcomes in patients with type 2 diabetes. So our colleagues in nephrology are pretty excited about the potential of canagliflozin, dapagliflozin, and empagliflozin to slow the progression of renal disease. And US FDA indications are being sought for these agents. John, thank you for that comprehensive summary on these important clinical trials. And, and there's little question that these agents represent a significant advance in the treatment of type 2 patients with ASCVD, heart failure, or diabetic kidney disease. And you've made that clear through these results. But what about patients who don't have any of these comorbidities? Lucia, what can you tell us about that? Well. The practical advantages of GLP-1 receptor agonists and the SGLT2 inhibitors include important patient-centered outcomes such as hypoglycemia, blood pressure, and weight. Like all agents approved for type 2 diabetes, GLP-1 receptor agonists and SGLT2 inhibitors are effective at reducing blood glucose concentrations. In fact, they are among the most effective agents for glucose lowering, probably second only to insulin. Generally, when we think of agents with high glycemic efficacy, the downside risk has typically been severe hypoglycemia. But unless you co-administer these particular agents with insulin or an insulin secretagogue, such as a sulfonylurea, the risk of severe hypoglycemia is actually minimal. You see this very clearly in the cardiovascular outcome trial results for the GLP-1 receptor agonists. No comparative statistics were computed for most of these trials, but you can see that the rates of the agents are quite similar to the rates with placebo, regardless of the exact metric they used. In our patients with cardiovascular disease, using basal insulin, for example, it wouldn't be unusual for them to have at least one episode of a severe hypoglycemic event in a year. By contrast, however, in the Excel study, the rates were less than one episode every 50 years. In Pioneer 6, the only patients who actually experienced severe hypoglycemia in either the treatment or the placebo group were either using insulin or a sulfonylurea. Severe hypoglycemia rates weren't defined or reported in a consistent way in the SGLT2 CVOTs, but the rates were generally similar to placebo. However, in Declare Timmy 58, 
Severe hypoglycemia rates were actually significantly lower with dapagliflozin than compared with placebo. Another important and consistent benefit of the GLP-1 receptor agonist class is that all of these agents promote weight loss. Not that they're approved as weight loss agents, but the effects are statistically significant across the board and clinically meaningful as well, since the mean weight loss was as high as 5% of body weight, which is the threshold established by the Diabetes Prevention Program as the level needed to improve health outcomes. Statistically significant but somewhat smaller placebo-subtracted weight reductions were also observed for the SGLT2 inhibitors. Again, none of these agents are currently approved as weight loss agents, but unlike sulfonylureas or TZDs, they do not promote weight gain. A further benefit is that both GLP-1 receptor agonists and SGLT2 inhibitors reduce blood pressure. The GLP-1 receptor agonists reduce systolic blood pressure by one to three millimeters of mercury across the cardiovascular outcome trials. More pronounced systolic blood pressure reductions were observed in the SGLT2 inhibitors. These effects are as pronounced as you would see with a low-dose thiazide diuretic and may be an important consideration for patients with, say, heart failure whose blood pressure may already be low. How well do the study groups of these CVOTs, these big trials, long-running trials, complicated in design, how well do these patients reflect the folks that you see in clinical practice? Well, you know, I think the patients who just have type 2 diabetes and cardiovascular disease, you know, I think estimates have been around 20%, but now we're seeing these trials where we got large numbers of people who didn't have cardiovascular disease, they're just at high risk, and we're seeing now included patients with chronic kidney disease, and we all see these patients in practice. So I'm starting to see that this is, while maybe perhaps a little bit of my sicker population, this is starting to look a lot like my practice. Myself, I work in an endocrinology practice, so my patients tend to be the sicker of the sick. Mm -hmm. So uh, the larger population for me would be patients that actually meet what was seen in the cardiovascular outcomes trials. But I will tell you more of the patients that are becoming referred to me by primary care don't necessarily have established cardiovascular disease, but do have some significant kidney um, indications, which is typically why they are being sent to me, because they're not sure what agent to proceed with. Right. And so um, I'm seeing a lot of those patients. And again, it is reassuring to see the data being so positive in that particular risk group. I find it very encouraging that some of the trials, especially some of the more recent ones, are including more and more people who are not so heavily burdened with established cardiovascular disease, which is a, a very exciting prospect for many of the patients that we would view as earlier in the progression right. uh, of their disease. Now, what about the risk of hypoglycemia? Are the risks of hypoglycemia with these agents as low in actual clinical practice as they seem to be in the CVOT? Yes, I really have been able to be as aggressive as I can with these patients, knowing that the risk for hypoglycemia is pretty much not something I have to worry about, unless, of course, they're on an insulin agent or a sulfonylurea, which I'm typically reducing, if not eliminating. And you know what that translates to in real practice? If I've got somebody on metformin, SGLT2, GLP-1, or maybe the combination of all three, guess how much they have to monitor? Right. I mean, you know, their A1C is doing fabulously. You've followed them for six months to a year. You've, for lack of a better word, put their diabetes in remission. They can spot check their glucose. It really does ease the burden of daily you know, diabetes management. And, and the cost of testing blood glucose is not something that can be overlooked. It really does add to the cost and burden of diabetes management. So if you have agents where you don't have to worry about hypoglycemia and the need to monitor as frequently um, can really make this disease a little bit easier to manage for our patients. And, and given the information that the both of you have summarized on these uh, trials, should we now consider switching all of our type 2 patients with 
uh, ASCVD, heart failure, or chronic kidney disease to one of these agents? Is now the time? I think it's a consideration. But remember, at the top of the ACE algorithm after metformin is GLP-1 receptor agonist G2 inhibitor already, even before we start talking about the new thought process. But, you know, I think what we're seeing in clinical practice is even the patients at glycemic goal. Mm -hmm. It used to be, well, any agent that gets you down, uh, you know, hypo, without hypoglycemia down to goal is fine. No, it's, it's different now. If you have CKD, if you have a risk for heart failure, have had heart failure, if you had ASCV, there are better agents to manage your cardiovascular risk as well as your dysglycemia. I tell my patients that it is not a glucocentric disease anymore. Mm -hmm. It's not just about the sugar sugar. Okay, <laughs> cardiovascular disease and kidney disease is so prevalent in the type 2 population that I'm always looking for ways to really approach the patient in a more global um, approach, not just looking at their blood glucoses, but what other risks do they have and what agents do I have in my arsenal that might be able to assist them. Now, one of the things that has crept into our conversation more uh, frequently especially since the results of these CVOTs, is an agent uh, or an, an issue that has flown under the radar in diabetes for a long time, and that's congestive heart failure. Yes. And uh, it, it's a significant health burden, mm -hmm. but more important, given the high costs of hospitalization associated with heart failure, have you seen signs that insurance plans are now willing to pay for these SGLT2 inhibitors in, in our patients? I think it's getting there. I mean, I don't think we're perfect yet, but I think what you're going to see is perhaps the silo of pharmacy benefits managers might have to talk to the greater carrier or payer because you can monetize a 35% reduction in hospitalization for heart failure. You can buy a lot of SGLT2 inhibitor for the reduction of the cost for these patients, not, not just to mention that and the burden of the patients of having heart failure. This has been a good discussion, but before we move into addressing the profusion of new guidelines in type 2 diabetes, I'd like to review some long established truths. To understand where we are, we need to know where we've been. The first of these truths is that intensive glycemic control reduces the risk of developing microvascular complications. Intensive used to mean the degree of glycemic control associated with avoidance of microvascular damage and also keeping the ketones away, as represented by glycated hemoglobin levels well below 9 to 10%. So how far below 9 to 10% should that be? ACE, or AACE, reasoned that since A1C equals 6.5% is the diagnostic threshold for diabetes. Patients with type 2 diabetes should generally strive for near normal glycemia, maintaining A1C levels less than or equal to 6.5%. ACE is willing to consider a higher target in patients with concomitant serious illness and at risk of hypoglycemia. So how about you, John and Lucia? Would you consider an A1C less than or equal to 6.5% a good general target, except for patients with concurrent serious illness and at risk for hypoglycemia? In what proportion of the patients that you care for are you comfortable targeting an A1C at that level? I will say the majority of my patients, even my sicker patients, I'm quite comfortable if they have access to these drugs that don't come with a risk of hypoglycemia. Yeah, I tend to agree. I have a lot of patients whose A1Cs are 5.8 because they're, as a primary care physician, I see these early on, right? Not, not the patient that's getting referred to you. So I put them on metformin, they have a little, uh, you know, awakening, they lose weight and their A1C is down. I don't necessarily decrease their metformin, but at the same time, if I've got a patient reasonably controlled, that does not mean that they come back to the clinic with an A1C of 6.7, I'm going to necessarily add a right. new medication, right? right? So it's, it's all very individualized and, and, you know, sometimes we'll see these patients in and out of their diet and, you know, things will fluctuate. But it does bring back into our view this notion that ADA used to champion that the target A1C should be as low as 
uh, as close to physiologic as feasible as long as you avoided things like hypoglycemia. And now with these newer agents, that begins to make eminently good sense. Now, the, the first cardiovascular outcome studies in type 2 diabetes, we're talking about UKPDS, Accord, Advance, and VADT, all investigated the effects of more intensive versus less intensive glycemic control on major adverse cardiovascular events, or MACE. These studies had somewhat different A1C goals, but all of them found that more intensive glycemic control reduced the risk of microvascular complications more than less intensive goals. But an even more important finding was that not all of the participants benefited equally from more intensive goals. These findings were synthesized and incorporated into the ADA EASD treatment recommendations. This was the first ADA guideline to strongly emphasize the specific factors to consider in the individualization of glycemic goals. Since that time, other organizations have proposed similar schemes for individualizing glycemic goals. The Endocrine Society has proposed A1C goals ranging from 7% to 8.5% for older adults, depending on their general health, cognitive function, and the other medications they're using. Note that shared decision-making is emphasized, even for patients in poor health. At the other end of the spectrum of opinion, we have the 2018 ACP guidance with its recommendation that most patients maintain A1Cs between 7 and 8 percent. More controversially, the ACP recommends de-intensifying therapy in patients with A1C levels of less than 6.5, whether or not they are experiencing hypoglycemia. The Diabetes Specialty Societies were sufficiently concerned about the ACP guideline that they issued a formal expression of concern. <laughs> John, what was the ADA's perspective on this guidance? They were not happy. Um, I think this flies in the face of a lot of years of clinical evidence to show microvascular risk goes up linearly and certainly if you want to tell me that a young, healthy, type 2 patient newly diagnosed can have an A1C of 7.9% and you can just leave them there, um, I just completely disagree and the ADA voiced that. I think there were some concerns. One, when the American Diabetes Association and other guidelines come out, there's usually new evidence, right? There's something new that compels us to change the way we're thinking. There was no new evidence. The other part about de-intensifying therapy, if I have a patient who's lost, five to seven percent of their body weight and their A1C is now six percent. Are they supposed to de-intensify their exercise and their diet? I, I just think I'd love to hear what you have to say about this because I think I just think I understand where they're coming from with safety. The concern was maybe they're on too many medications but I still think the science says less than seven percent and where you can less than six. So we have real polarization of guideline recommendations here. Lucia, can these different points of view be reconciled? Well, I think the bone of contention was the word most in the ACP guidelines, that most patients with type 2 diabetes, and we just discussed that the majority of patients are not the ones with the cardiovascular disease like we see in the cardiovascular outcomes trials. The majority of patients are your healthy, younger folks that can have aggressive management. I think where there is room for reconciliation is that both ACP and ADA really want you as a clinician to take the patient that is sitting before you and individualize that treatment. My, my hope is also that with the evidence that's being generated with these newer agents and their lessened risk of hypoglycemia, the, the likelihood of doing harm would be significantly mitigated and that would, would, would decrease the, the, the level of anxiety that some might have about getting to lower targets. Right. I think so. So the AHA and the HFSA guidelines, the Heart Failure Society of America, uh, guidelines for patients with type 2 diabetes and heart failure, combines elements 
of the ACE, ADA, and Endocrine Society guidelines, suggesting that the A1C goals should range from 6.5 to 8.5 percent. The AHA, HFSA guidelines accounts for hypoglycemia risk, but also helpfully points out that goals above 8.5 percent increase the risk of symptomatic hyperglycemia. Now these guidelines also call attention to treatment burden. This is a topic that we'll explore in more depth later in this activity. So John and Lucia, what do you think about the AHA HFSA guidelines? I think they are pretty consistent with the other guidelines. Again, individualizing the care, taking into consideration comorbidities and other health factors, whether it be motivation, social support, those kind of things that support the patient with whatever they need to accomplish to manage their chronic conditions and be aggressive along those lines. I think that's true, and I think these patients with heart failure, you know them in your practice. I mean, they're, they're fairly ill yeah. individuals. They've likely had diabetes for a long time, so you're not going to necessarily affect microvascular risk by going from seven and a half to eight and a half, as long as, like you said, they don't have symptomatic hyperglycemia. Now, beyond heart failure, would you recommend it for patients with type two and other comorbidities? I mean, I think so. I mean, we've got those patients in our practice who are frail. They have not a lot of support, and the next intensification may be insulin or something that's got the potential for causing hypoglycemia. And you look at them, and they're 8.2. They may have a lifespan and life expectancy of another couple, three years. I'm okay with that. Yes, and you also have to put it into the patient's perspective. Sometimes these chronically ill patients, depending what else they're contending with, their ability to exert control over something is the one thing that they want, and sometimes it is their diabetes management. So they may not be willing to de-intensify. They really are continuing to tightly manage their blood sugars because that's the one thing that they have control over. So again, it's really patient-based. Right. Those are very good points, guys. Now, while glycemic control continues to be of paramount importance in managing type 2 diabetes, we now know that how that control is achieved can make a difference, and that there are some agents that are particularly beneficial in certain patient populations. As a consequence of the burgeoning data supporting CV benefits with these agents, multiple guidelines now prioritize the GLP-1 receptor agonists and SGLT-2 inhibitors for second-line treatment. That is to say, after lifestyle modifications and metformin monotherapy no longer suffice to control glucose levels. ACE has been prioritizing the GLP-1 receptor agonists and the SGLT2 inhibitors for a number of years. In the past, those recommendations derived from the low risk of hypoglycemia and weight gain observed with these classes of agents. In this year's guidelines, you'll see that they've highlighted them in green, making them the top two classes throughout the progression of type 2 diabetes. They also note that certain GLP-1 receptor agonists and SGLT2 inhibitors have shown CVD and CKD benefits and are preferred in patients with those complications. They further note that one of these medications should be included if coronary heart disease is present. Observe also that the ACE guidelines are still glucose-centric. That is, glucose levels are the primary criterion used to determine recommended treatment. The new ADA guidelines consider both glucose levels and the presence of ASCVD or CKD. For first-line therapy, a glucose level in the diagnostic range for diabetes dictates the initiation of metformin. But second-line, the presence of cardiac and renal comorbidities dictate the addition of either a GLP-1 or an SGLT-2 at any A1C level above goal. 
These classes of agents are also among those that are preferred for minimizing the risks of hypoglycemia or weight gain. And in a departure from past guidance, the ADA guidelines now recommend GLP-1 receptor agonists as the first injectable therapy. For patients with some functioning beta cells, GLP-1 receptor agonists are more effective than oral agents for glycemic control. Relative to basal insulin, GLP-1s are weight sparing and less likely to cause hypoglycemia. However, GLP-1s are not a substitute for basal insulin. For patients with severe insulin deficiency, whether due to long-standing type 2 diabetes, symptomatic uh, elevated glucose levels, or a clinical presentation that is type 1 diabetes-like, there is no substitute for insulin. As much as patients and clinicians may resist graduating to basal insulin, it is often necessary. One more point about using GLP-1 receptor agonists or basal insulin. In type 2, generally, these agents are used with at least one and perhaps as many as three other agents to attain glycemic goals. Both ADA and ACE emphasize advancing therapy every three months until goals are met, adding agents in sequence. First, we need to avoid untoward interactions between the selected agents. To that end, the ADA and EASD offer specific recommendations for discontinuation or dose reduction as injectable agents are added to an oral treatment regimen. The key recommendations vis-a-vis -vis GLP-1 receptor agonists are that you don't want to give any GLP-1 with a DPP-4 inhibitor, since both influence the same physiological pathways. And you should consider dose reduction for sulfonylureas and insulin to avoid hypoglycemia. These recommendations would also apply in the event an oral GLP-1 is approved. Our cardiology colleagues have also gotten into the diabetes guidelines business. Uh, this is not surprising given the sheer numbers of patients with heart disease who also have type 2 diabetes. It's interesting to see that the American College of Cardiology abandons the glucose-centric approach entirely. Note the placement of the SGLT2 inhibitors and GLP-1 receptor agonists at the same level as, quote, guideline-directed medical therapy. This placement is saying that as far as they are concerned, these agents merit the same consideration as blood pressure agents, statins, anticoagulants, antiplatelet agents, and so forth. Also note that they do not prioritize one class over the other, relying on shared decision-making to make that determination. Meanwhile, the American Heart Association and the Heart Failure Society of America offer more detailed and nuanced recommendations for GLP-1 and SGLT-2 use in patients with or at risk for heart failure. Like the ADA, they prioritize SGLT-2 inhibitors for patients with heart failure. And note that GLP-1s are a reasonable alternative for most such patients. Theirs is the only current guideline that cautions about potentially unfavorable effects of GLP-1 receptor agonists in patients with heart failure and reduced ejection fra fractions, or HEFREF, and recent decompensation. The Endocrine Society offers detailed recommendations for the use of GLP-1s and SGLT-2s in older adults, including those with CKD or CVD. This guideline clarifies that GLP-1 receptor agonists can generally be used in patients with lower 
EGFRs than the SGLT2 inhibitors and specifies EGFR thresholds for each agent according to the uh, FDA prescribing information circa 2018. Now, please bear in mind that these thresholds could change in the near future. For example, recall that the Credence trial was conducted in patients with EGFR levels from 30 to less than 90 milliliters per minute and albumin creatinine ratios of greater than 300 to 5,000 milligrams per gram. It showed that canagliflozin was effective and well tolerated in patients with mild to moderate renal disease. So let me ask the two of you, which guidelines do you use in your practice and, and why? Or, or do you limit yourself to one set of guidelines? I, I think we or I will probably use a conglomeration of all of them. It's, they all pretty much speak the same language. Choosing agents that don't promote hypoglycemia, hopefully limit weight gain, and then the non-glucose benefits of these agents for patients with established cardiovascular disease, if it's atherogenic predominant, or those that have heart failure predominant or chronic kidney disease. And, you know, of course, the patient's in the middle of that and having that discussion with the patient to make sure we know what their preferences are, what their affordability is, what the access is, and so forth. Right, I agree. I mean, I think, I think these guidelines, much when we had the ADA versus ACE, they're much more similar than they are dissimilar, mm -hmm. and they say a lot of the same things. And again, it comes down to sort of having the understanding of where these agents are, where the benefits are, where the risks are, and having a discussion with your patient. Now, you, you are opinion leaders, and you may operate in a somewhat different way sometimes than many of your colleagues. Do you have impressions about your colleagues where you are? Uh, are they inclined to go with one or the other, or do they also have this sort of spectrum approach? I mean, I think I could say in primary care, the, the needle really is moving. I mean, I think they're starting to think about cardiovascular outcomes trials. I'm not sure they're there for the renal outcomes because that's kind of recent, but I do think the heart failure and the cardiovascular outcomes are starting to open some people's eyes about how they should be managing those patients. Well, beyond that, what, what is your advice for using GLP-1s and SGLT-2s with insulin, as we are now beginning to see uh, more frequently? Well, you certainly can use both of those agents, either individually or together with insulin. My recommendation is definitely to reduce that insulin or at least have the patient monitoring their blood glucose so that we can keep them safe, especially with some of the longer, ultra-long-acting basal insulin we have. We have to be mindful that we might need to act a little sooner than we typically did with some of the older basal insulin. Yeah, and you know, it's also where's the patient, right? Is there fasting glucose 160 and everyone sees eight and a half? Or is there someone closer to goal whose right. fastings are a little lower? We know that you're gonna lower fasting glucose with SGLT2 inhibitors, 35 milligrams per deciliter, perhaps a little bit more with some of the GLP-1s. You can start doing the math in your head and going, we don't want them waking up at five o'clock in the morning hypoglycemic. Along the lines of adverse events that you, you might be concerned about, certainly with the SGLT2 inhibitors, uh, DKA, euglycemic DKA in, in particular has been one of those issues. Uh, how commonly uh, do you see it or have you seen it or, or even hear about it and w what's your approach to preventing it or earlier detection of it? I think being mindful as to where the euglycemic DKA actually reared itself in patients in, with type 2 diabetes. We won't be talking about patients with type 1, that's definitely off-label use. Uh, but in our patients with type 2, the ones that actually had the issue were usually those that had had the diabetes for a very long time and may have been more type 1 diabetes-like in their initial presentation and misdiagnosed, or they were severely ill. Um, 
compromise because of surgery or alcohol use. So again, making sure that we choose the patients appropriately and we counsel those that are getting ready to have a surgery that they need to withhold from the SGLT2 inhibitor for at least a couple of days. And then I reinstate those medications once I know that they're able to not just eat and drink but maintain those substances without vomiting or diarrhea. And you know, Jim, you know, for in the summer months, we talk about hydration. She said, but if you're coming in the hospital, I tell my patients on SGLT2 inhibitors, if you're having a gastrointestinal virus, right. nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, unless you're eating and drinking normally, you're not going to take the SGLT2 inhibitors. So I think there's a lot of risk mitigating we can do. With the emergence of these cl new classes of drugs with these important benefits, mm -hmm. Uh, now, the, the threshold for the glucose level that prompts people to start testing for, for ketones has to change. And, and that's now something that should be incorporated into the way we teach about DKA detection and, and management. And maybe also education in the emergency department. Absolutely. For the final segment of this activity, I'd like to discuss patient-centered treatment considerations across the spectrum of type 2 diabetes progression. Now, first of all, patients may be unaware that type 2 diabetes is a progressive disease. Consequently, they may become discouraged if they need to add any new agent to their treatment regimen, let alone add insulin or some other injectable therapy. They may even blame themselves for not having done a better job of self-managing and have an unwarranted sense of guilt over a process that is not their fault. A study of over 5,000 patients with type 2 diabetes examined clinical and genetic factors that were associated with the need for insulin therapy, which they defined as having insulin initiated or an A1C greater than or equal to 8.5 percent treated with two or more non-insulin therapies. In addition to elevated triglycerides and low HDL, this study found that genetic factors are strongly associated with the initial diagnosis of type 2 diabetes and a different set of genetic factors are associated with rapid progression. The National Diabetes Education Program, or NDEP, asked over 2,500 adults from the U.S. aged 35 or older if they thought any of the health problems shown on the y-axis of this graphic can be caused by diabetes. The group included people with and without type 2 diabetes. Overall awareness of the link between type 2 diabetes and CVD or CKD were poor. People with diabetes were more aware of this link than people with prediabetes, who were in turn more aware of this link than people at risk of diabetes. And people at risk of diabetes were more aware than all others. So overall awareness of the link between type 2 diabetes and hypertension or high cholesterol were even worse. Lucia, I would be interested to know if these survey findings correspond with your clinical experience. I mean, given that patients with diabetes are two to four times as likely to die of CVD as patients without diabetes, and given that we now have medications that reduce that risk, do we have more information about what patients do and don't know about CVD and diabetes? That's an excellent question, Jim. Thank you for asking. We do have a small but detailed survey of U.S. adults that have had diabetes for about six years and found a low awareness of a lot of information we as clinicians may assume is well known or well understood. The link between high LDL cholesterol and heart disease is fundamental to our current standards of care, but there was poor awareness of this link among these patients. Knowledge of cardiovascular disease risk factors was also lacking, and patients didn't know that certain exercise could reduce cardiovascular disease risk. 
Now, that's important background to know for our discussions with patients. We can't assume that they are aware of information we would consider to be common knowledge. So taken together, we have patients who don't recognize that they have a disease that requires the progressive addition of new medications to manage it. Also, they probably won't deeply consider the benefit of medications that reduce cardiovascular risk, since many don't perceive themselves to be at risk of cardiovascular events. I think it's important to also note where these patients receive their information, which was detailed in the survey. The vast majority of them are getting their information not from their health care providers, but from actual media, newspaper, television, radio. We also need to consider their cultural backgrounds. So in that same survey that I just pointed to, Hispanic population, Caucasian, and blacks were included as the ethnic groups. And the highest need for education was among the Hispanic group. This is obviously a very broad topic that we can't address in depth here. But I wanted to make you aware that the American Association of Clinical Endocrinologists recently issued a position statement addressing transcultural diabetes care. They have some recommendations for how to handle the all too common situation in which the clinician's cultural background with all of its built-in assumptions differs from the patient's cultural background. They specifically address African Americans, Latino and Hispanics, Asian Americans, and Native Americans in this guideline. The core recommendations span 10 categories, each of which could be the foundation of its own educational activity. The list includes such practical issues as having flexible office hours, or having seating available for family members who come to an office visit with the actual patient. To more obvious cross-cultural communication obstacles like terminology and jargon, nutrition messaging, and health literacy. I'd like to draw particular attention to the behavioral medicine recommendations. First comes trust. We must establish that. We have ample research showing that trust is the foundation of clinician-patient relationship. Shared decision-making is an important way to build that trust and to motivate patients. Shared decision-making has also received renewed emphasis in the current American Diabetes Association guidelines. If you ask clinicians whether they use it, they'll usually tell you that if they had enough time, they would. And of course, there's never enough time. Consequently, patient surveys show that shared decision-making is not a routine part of clinical practice. The Veterans Administration Department of Defense published a detailed step-by-step flowchart explaining how to do patient-centered education and care. We don't have time to explore it in depth, but you can find it by following the link shown here. The strength of this rather complex document is that it explicitly includes eye and foot care reminders. We've likely all heard of the five A's approach to motivational interviewing, but it's hard to remember what all the A's stand for and in what order you're supposed to use them in. The VA DOD guidelines include motivational interviewing, but they use the acronym SHARE, S-H-A-R-E, making it easier to remember what EAT item stands for and the order you're supposed to do them in. Lucia, I'm guessing that shared decision making is baked into the job description for diabetes educators uh, like yourself. What advice would you give to clinicians who are still functioning in the old treatment paradigm, doctor knows best? That's a very good question, and it also comes on the other side of the patient. A lot of patients are not open to share decision-making either. They really want to defer to the provider before them, just tell me what to do. 
So when you're having this discussion with the patients and you're presenting the options to them, I like to tell the patient, you have veto power. And while you may not know exactly how this drug may impact you, if you're willing to try it, I need you to be forthright and um, open with me about any problems you may have and not wait until the next scheduled visit to let me know that you experienced a problem. John, you might want to weigh in on this as yeah. well about colleagues that you might have who are still locked into that paradigm. Yeah, I mean, and, and to Lucia's and your point, this takes a little bit of extra time, but you know, one of the biggest problems we have with our patients, and this is across all disease entities, is adherence. And what I find is if you're sitting down with the patient, taking that extra five minutes to have a discussion and say, okay, here's an option, an SGLT2 inhibitor, but maybe these are the reasons I want to do a GLP-1 receptor agonist. Would you be willing to do a once a day? Would you prefer a once a week? Um, help me understand. Do you want a hidden needle? Are you okay putting pen needles on? And just getting some buy-in. A lot of times they'll say, well, what do you think? I'll say, well, here are my best recommendations. What do you think in terms of your ability to do that? And you just find that it empowers the patient. An important aspect of shared decision making turns out to be letting patients know what they can expect from the medications we recommend. Indeed, recent research into the root causes of medication non-adherence shows that uncertainty about what to expect from medications has a substantial negative effect on adherence. Coupled with this, is a fear of side effects. So let's talk about the common side effects of the GLP-1 receptor agonists and SGLT2 inhibitors. Lucia, how do we, or how should we set expectations for these agents? Well, the most obvious difference between the GLP-1 receptor agonists and the SGLT2 inhibitors is that currently, all of the available GLP-1 receptor agonists are administered by an injection, and all of the SGLT2 inhibitors are oral tablets. The GLP-1 receptor agonists are administered anywhere from twice daily to once weekly, and the SGLT2 inhibitors are all administered once daily. The research that's been done on patient preferences for medication delivery backs up common sense. Small pills are preferred over large pills. Pills are preferred to injections. Small needles are preferred to large needles. Less frequent dosing is preferred over more frequent dosing. Each of these classes of agents has a characteristic safety profile that may also influence how easy these medications are to live with or not. Let's talk about how these agents make patients feel. The GLP-1 receptor agonist's mechanism of action contributes to promote satiety. In other words, feeling more full or satisfied after eating. This sensation may be unfamiliar to some of our patients with type 2 diabetes. Nausea is the most common adverse event. It does usually diminish with time, but if the patients aren't made aware that that is in fact going to go away with time, they may give up the medication before they've actually given it a chance. We can also inform them that we can minimize the risk of nausea by limiting portion sizes and avoiding foods that are high in fat because high fat foods also contribute to slowing the gastric emptying. Fullness is sometimes mistaken for nausea. So gradual dose titration can also help limit the nausea when it's applicable with the agent. So the bottom line is, and it's true with just about every medication we use on our patients, is to start low and go slow. Patients initiating SGLT2 inhibitors may need to make more frequent trips to the bathroom, especially initially. Increased urination is common after the initiation of an SGLT2 inhibitor, but this effect usually diminishes with time. There will also be a need to urinate more frequently if they consume sugary beverages or food. Genital mycotic infections are the most common adverse effects of the SGLT2 inhibitors, and these are more common in women than in men. A recent meta-analysis of clinical trials disputes the notion that these agents increase the risk of a urinary tract infection. In any case, 
Patients can minimize the risk of genital and urinary infections with increased hydration, good personal hygiene, and by avoiding sugary foods, especially beverages. Any infections that do occur can be successfully treated in the usual manner. Thanks for that summary, uh, Lucia. As impressive as the benefits of the GLP-1 receptor agonists and SGLT-2 inhibitors are, there are a few patients who should definitely not use them. John, maybe you can run through the limitations that we have surrounding these agents. I'd be happy to. Thanks, Jim. There are very few absolute contraindications to the use of GLP-1 receptor agonists, the foremost being a personal or family history of medullary thyroid carcinoma or a personal history of MEN2, that is multiple endocrine neoplasia 2. There are boxed warnings on all of the GLP-1 receptor agonists except lixazinotide and exenotide BID for MTC and MEN2. This stems from the increased risk of thyroid tumors observed in rodent studies during the initial development of these agents. But human thyroids aren't like rodent thyroids, and the CVOTs show that adverse thyroid outcomes of any type were really unusual with no difference for any of these agents versus placebo. Of course, you would not use these agents in any patient with a history of hypersensitivity to them. You'd also be wise to select some other class of agent in patients with a history of unexplained pancreatitis, current heavy alcohol use, or gastroparesis. Lixazenotide and both forms of exenotide are metabolized in the kidney, so these agents should be avoided in patients with severe renal impairment or who are on dialysis. On the other hand, liraglutide, dulaglutide, and semaglutide can be used without dose adjustment in patients with renal impairment. The SGLT2s depend upon adequate renal function for their mechanism of action, which is why they are contraindicated in patients with severe renal impairment, end-stage renal disease, or dialysis. Their adverse effect profile is consistent with a medication that increases urinary glucose excretion. The adverse events of agents within the class are more similar than they are different. What about the rare but frightening side effects? This is where the CVOTs have been very helpful. They've alleviated a lot of concern because of the long duration and the number of patients enrolled in these studies. Gallbladder events were equally common whether patients were treated with GLP-1s or placebo. Same story for pancreatitis and cancer. You may recall that the FDA and EMA placed the GLP-1 receptor agonist class under a microscope after some researchers thought they saw increased risk of pancreatitis and pancreatic cancer in retrospective studies. The CVOTs showed pancreatitis and pancreatic cancer rates well under 1% across the trials. And thyroid carcinoma was even rarer. Of course, these trials were not powered to differentiate risks in cancer endpoints, but the lack of a safety signal is really encouraging. Of the SGLT2 CVOTs reported to date, an increased risk of amputation was seen only in canvas. Since then, other trials of canagliflozin have not found an increased risk, and no amputation signal was seen with the other SGLT2s. Cancer incidence was rare but similar between groups without clustering by organ system. DKA can occur in insulin-treated patients with severe beta cell deficiency if their insulin dose is cut back too much. You can catch this before it becomes an emergency, by monitoring for serum or urine ketones. A suspected association between SGLT2s and Fournier's gangrene has been reported in post-marketing studies, but was reported only in Declare, with five cases in the placebo group and one in the dapagliflozin group. Thank you for those insights, uh, John and Lucia. Now, thinking about cultural influences on medication acceptance, have you ever been surprised by the reasons that a patient embraces or rejects one of these agents? Uh, alternatively, how often should clinicians be performing eye, foot, and kidney screenings in patients using GLP-1s or SGLT-2 uh, inhibitors? Well, you know, specifically for GLP-1 receptor agonists, the only signal that was really seen in terms of retinopathy was in sustained six, where patients with what seemingly had high baseline mm -hmm. A1Cs um, might have had an initial worsening of their retinopathy, and the theory goes that maybe it was the rapid lowering, because semaglutide's a fairly potent agent. But what's interesting is, as 
time went on, that sort of, you know, went away, went away and eased itself out. But um, in general, your point is well made. We need to be doing regular foot exams. We need to be asking about regular foot care. We need to be getting regular ophthalmologic dilated retinal exams. I recommend once a year. Sometimes in the very low risk patient, we'll have them put it off every couple of years. But this just has to be part of care. And the majority of patients with neuropathy will be asymptomatic. So you're only going to catch them if you're actually doing a foot exam. To answer your question about um, what surprises me, there's very little that <laughs> surprises me in a clinical visit anymore. But I have had a few patients who wanted to stop either the GLP-1 receptor agonist or the SGLT-2 inhibitor because they were losing too much weight. They still had a lot of weight to go, mind you, but they were not comfortable in their own skin anymore. Now, another issue here is polypharmacy. It is obviously a concern for many patients with type 2 diabetes and comorbidities. Both of you have talked about how many things we are monitoring and treating patients for. How can these newer agents, the GLP-1s and the SGLT-2s, simplify treatment regimens for these kinds of patients? Well, I've had patients when we talk about goals that often one of the goals is I want to come off all my meds. <laughs> and I assure them that they will when they die. They won't need any meds, but our goal is to have them live a full healthy life with little complications. And again, to use as few medications as possible. So when you look at the medications we have available and the ominous octet and the, variety, or the various pathological reasons behind the hyperglycemia, a drug like a GLP-1, which can hit so many of those, about four to six, depending on which study you're looking at, can impact those pathological um, effects, as well as the spillover benefit with blood pressure and kidney protection and cardiovascular disease outcomes. So we may very well be able to limit some of that pharmacology with some of these newer agents. You know, and Jim, in, in clinical practice, now that we've seen these GLP-1s in, in practice for what, 13 years now, um, I have a lot of patients both on metformin, maybe an SGLT2 inhibitor, but particularly on the GLP-1 receptor agonist, we don't ever like to talk about putting diabetes in remission. But you know, in primary care, I've got patients that come in, I hadn't talked about their diabetes in about a year. We talk about their back pain, we talk about their depression, we talk about their grandkids. But these medicines, to your point, seem to do something different in terms of beta cell function, whether it's preservation, preserving beta cell mass. Um, they just seem to have a durability that I never saw with the earlier agents. Yeah. And, and one might also note that except for the restriction of using a GLP-1 with a DPP-4 inhibitor, that these drugs are surprisingly compatible mm -hmm. and, and complementary to agents that people might already uh, be on. So why don't we discuss these issues in the context of a clinical case? So John, why don't you lead us through the, the, the case of George? So George is very much like a patient I had in practice about four to six months ago. 63-year-old man, diabetes for about five years. This is his six-month follow-up visit. Remember, it's a six-month follow-up visit because he's been pretty well controlled. But since the last time we saw him, he'd had unstable angina and had been admitted and had stenting of both his right coronary artery and his LAD. He's been through cardiac rehab, he's currently walking, he's stable, no chest pain, no shortness of breath, and we see here his medications, which are maximum dose metformin, a beta blocker, the usual antiplatelet agents, aspirin, clopidogrel, as well as a high intensity statin, and he's maintained on metformin and citagliptin at 100 milligrams a day. BMI just short of being obese, he had a preserved ejection fraction, so he really didn't have an MI, did not have damage. Um, A1C, not that far from goal, but not as good as he used to be. You know, 7.8% and he has normal renal function. So the question now becomes, since the events that happened six months prior, does this change the way we think about treating George? So you got a patient, not at goal. Uh, now the issue of established cardiovascular disease is no longer ambiguous. It's clear. And he's on uh, what we would consider to be a suboptimal. Uh, diabetes control regimen and he needs some intensification. What, what, what do you think we ought to be uh, thinking about here? I would be harnessing on the fact that he had this recent event because he is going to be probably in his most motivated state 
and will be open to just about anything we discuss at this point. And knowing that he is on metformin and tolerating it without any problems and on citagliptin, which is a DPP-4 inhibitor, now would be my chance to really try to convince him into using a GLP-1 receptor agonist, given that his atherosclerotic disease seems to be predominant here, and the drug of choice would be a GLP-1 receptor agonist at this point. And, and of course, you'd want to stop the DPP-4 inhibitor when you do that. Right. Um, but I so agree with what you say. You know, my, my, my role in trying to discuss this with patients is like, okay, this has happened. You and I don't want to ever cross this bridge again. We don't ever want to have this discussion again. This needs to be the last cardiovascular event for ages. So how do we do that? And you're right. They really understand the link now, and you have a motivated patient in front of you. But, but George represents a patient who's going to be in a continuum of the kinds of folks that we're going to have to make these decisions right. about. He's got an ejection fraction of 55%, okay? And, and let's think about the fact that let's just give him an EGFR of 70. What would it do to your thinking about George if his ejection fraction was 35%? Well, you know, he hasn't had heart failure yet, but boy, yes. that reduced, yeah, yes. right. So that reduced ejection fraction makes me think maybe I start leaning toward an SGLT2 mm -hmm. inhibitor. I'll leave the DPP-4 on board. We know that we can get a 0.8 to a 1% lowering at that sort of A1C baseline and get him down less than 7%. And now it really changes my thinking. Or start him on the GLP-1 and add the SGLT2 inhibitor right. and really hone in. And, and, and now we have to start thinking about the shared decision-making issues that you talk Correct. about. Because you want to make sure that you do the best thing for him, but you, want, you don't want to complicate his therapy any more than, uh, than you need to. Uh, if we add it to the, the profile of this case, and EGFR, not 70, but what if it was 45? Are we further constrained in what we can offer, uh, George? We may be. Uh, we know that the SGLT2 inhibitors start to lose efficacy as far as glucose management with an EGFR below 45. And there is, there are at least two of the GLP-1s that are eliminated via the kidney, so their dose restriction may come in. Um, by and large, the GLP-1s give you the most flexibility when it comes to EGFR and their ability to be used regardless of status of kidney function. So, yeah, as kidney decline sets in, we have some issue. Once some of the data that we're starting to see with Credence and some of the other renal data starts to really come out, we may see that we will be able to use these agents outside of their glucose effectiveness for these other reasons, even with lower GFRs. This very same George, instead of walking into your uh, office with uh, a BMI of 29, could be in that 80% of patients with uh, uh, type 2 diabetes who are overweight or obese. So he might come in with a 36 BMI. Now your urgency shifts in yet another direction for what the most appropriate agent is for him. Right, and you might, in that case, really think about a GLP-1 receptor agonist, and you know, we know that weight loss is a great non-glycemic benefit, and I think more so in terms of kilograms of weight loss than pound per pound for an SGLT2 inhibitor, so that might guide your therapy even more in that direction. And you know, and I'm particularly fascinated by the fact that we, we're now starting to see um, CVOTs where the mean A1C at baseline wasn't eight, right. mm -hmm. but, but closer to what we strive for, like 7.3. Mm -hmm. What if this guy walked in with the same constellation of findings in terms of his cardiovascular problems, but now, John, he had a, uh, an A1C already at 6.8? I think that really goes to our discussion point. Even though he's at his glycemic goal, he is not at his cardiovascular maximal risk reduction. And I think DPP-4 inhibitors, nice, they're nice. They've all been proven to be non-inferior and very safe. But the citagliptin provides him no real benefit right. from a cardiovascular standpoint. So even though he's at goal, I think it begs the question, he still needs a change in therapy. I agree. We cannot have a glucocentric approach as our only approach for our patients with type 2 diabetes and established disease. 
and we have to be careful that some of the DPP-4 inhibitors may actually increase the risk for heart failure in our patients. You know, one of the things that I try to, to teach our residents and students is that it's really important when you're seeing complicated patients to, to try to sort out uh, what's broken? What, what are the impairments? How many boxes do you need to check on the pathway towards improvement or restoration of as much normalcy uh, as possible? And you, you raise the point that the DPP-4 inhibitors don't do anything for you in weight reduction. They don't really do anything for you in terms of uh, blood pressure. Uh, reduction. We don't have any established cardiovascular benefits for a person right. with established CVDs. So this is a really important demonstration of the multitude of considerations that we really need to be taking into consideration when we make decisions on how should we best deploy these newer agents, given the new information that we have about them that we can bring to bear on things like not only diabetes control, glycemia, but other elements of concern, like in the case of George, uh, emerging cardiovascular or kidney disease uh, risks. So this has been a really uh, helpful way of contextualizing uh, this discussion. Well, thank you all very much for, uh, for all of the insights that you've brought to this discussion. Uh, we are now able to have conversations with each other and with our patients because of the advent of these new drugs and these uh, new insights and these new effects that we've seen that puts on the table all of the elements of the diabetes, the cardiovascular disease, the kidney disease, all of these things now are wrapped in the same narrative because we can now do something about all of them. And that's really a change from where we've been. So let me thank all of you for joining us today. I hope that you found this explanation of the rationale and evidence supporting the high prioritization given to the GLP-1 receptor agonists and the SGLT2 inhibitors in the current guidelines for the management of type 2 diabetes to be helpful to you in your practices. Each of these classes of agents offers multiple benefits to our patients and may help reduce the total number of medications patients need to take just to maintain not only adequate glycemic control, but cardiovascular and renal events as well. This is an area of rapid advancement and new treatment indications. The GLP-1 receptor agonists and SGLT2 inhibitors have much to offer our patients. Both patients and clinicians should, however, be aware of differences between these medication classes the agents within the classes, and be prepared to discuss treatment choices in the context of shared decision-making. So thanks again, and we hope you found this activity informative and useful for your practice. This activity has been jointly provided by Penn State College of Medicine and PVI, Peerview Institute for Medical Education. Thank you for listening. Download materials and complete the post-test for instant credit at peerview.com forward slash ASM 860. This activity is supported by independent educational grants from AstraZeneca LP, Beringer Ingelheim Pharmaceuticals Incorporated and Lilly USA LLC, and Merck & Company Incorporated.